Today on Twin Cam, this is the one. We're going to refit Melody's power unit, wire and plumb everything in, and see if she starts. So last time out, we had a bit of a nightmare with the transfer casing because I'd mixed up some bolts. But we got all that sorted, remarried the engine and gearbox, and we're all ready to put the engine in, sans the clutch, as I'd been a bit of a melon. But as the A-Series is the easiest engine in the world to change a clutch on, I can just do that later. So you join Connor and I wrestling with drive shafts, followed by wrestling with engine mounts. You might remember that we installed a new set of four engine mounts a couple of videos ago, and with no clutch cover, we can only bolt up three of them, but the one on the offside rear still put up one hell of a fight. At this point, we don't quite know why, hence the voiceover, but all will become clear further down the track. You join me again very nearly three months after the last bit of video was shot, and the reason for that massive delay hasn't been uh, because we've hit a brick wall mechanically or anything like that. It's just a general lack of motivation uh, that just suddenly came and now it's gone. So now that I have the will to get on again with this car, we're going to get it finished. Not all today, but I have a few minutes out here in the garage. So we're going to bolt the clutch and the flywheel to the end of the crankshaft. Um, now, I can't remember whether I mentioned on camera why we didn't have it all buttoned up when we put the engine in the car, but essentially I sent the clutch, the old clutch off um, in exchange for a new one. And accidentally I sent off the flywheel boss that actually allows you, um, you know, to, to tighten the bolt on the end of the crankshaft that tightens the clutch and flywheel um, to the side of the engine. So that's an idiot move on my behalf, but I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know what was what, and I didn't know what I'd get back. So um, now that I've rescued the flywheel boss and all the bolts, it's all bolted back together just off camera down there. Um, I had to do it in a vice, so I had to take it to my grandparents, because they have a vice. Um, and now we can put it back on the side of the engine. So in the three months the car's been sat here, it really has just been sat here. I've not touched it at all. Um, it's missing that engine mount, of course. Um, I mean, you'll have all just seen this stuff. Um, whereas it seems as though I'm looking at it from a fresh approach now and we've been holding it up for that entire time with this jack here underneath the sump. So uh, the engine hasn't been resting totally off canter or anything like that but now that we're here let's get back to work and we'll put that clutch and flywheel on the end of the engine. I thought I'd show you all specifically what I'm talking about because this is the clutch and flywheel assembly. Um, this is the flywheel that we've got here um, and these teeth around the outside are what the starter motor engages on in order to turn the engine and start the car. In the middle here, slightly off centre, um, is the clutch plate itself. So that's sandwiched in between. And then on this side, we have the pressure plate, which is secured with these bolts to the flywheel. Um, and we have the flywheel boss in the centre, which is bolted to the back of this pressure plate. So um, that's the part that I accidentally sent off and wasn't meant to. Unfortunately, you, well, you can still get these, but you can't get the bolts, or at least I couldn't find the spec for the bolts to buy them not specialised for a Mini or a Metro, um, and so you can't buy the bolts from Mini kind of websites they show out of stock. So now it's back, that's all good. Um, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the clutch, which obviously is on the other side, you can see from the other side, is perfectly centred, or actually more so that it's loose within the housing so I need to just loosen off the pressure plate ever so slightly to loosen the clutch to be able to slide it over the crankshaft properly get it engaged then we can tighten these back up put the big bolt in the middle tighten it up and then put the cover on and everything on the engine will be done At long last, the new clutch can meet the power unit, and without a clutch centering tool, it takes a couple of goes to get the clutch plate splined correctly onto the crankshaft. But with that out of the way, we need to bolt on this flywheel locking tool where the starter motor usually lives. 
As it suggests, this locks the flywheel so I can tighten everything up without turning the engine over. Now I've got everything aligned, I can torque up the pressure plate bolts, carefully install the keyway correctly, that took a few attempts, then fit the centre bolt, remember to put the handbrake on to keep the car still, and put a bit of welly into it. With a screwdriver, I knocked over the tabs to lock the bolt, and finally, we can fit the sleeve on the end. Our final step before saying goodbye is to remove the locking tool and refit the starter motor. And finally, we can refit the nicely cleaned up clutch cover, complete with engine mount. Can you tell I forgot to clean up the transfer casing? Next on the to-do list is the rocker cover, because while this used to be perfectly serviceable, when I bolted the engine lifting brackets to it, I tightened them too much out of fear, warping the cover, so we need to fit a new one. Fortunately, because A-Series engines are popular, I bought a reproduction MG Metro rocker cover, and doesn't that just look spectacular? What I didn't know at this point was that it needed longer bolts because this cover is physically taller, but now we can return to the engine mounts, because with some hardware having turned up, I encountered an issue I warned you all about back in episode 4. So I thought I wouldn't bother filming any of the getting it back onto the engine mount saga, because there's nothing entertaining about it, it's an awful lot of rubbish for me to edit through, because um, it'll take an absolute age, and it's hardly satisfying, even when it does sit down right on the mount. The satisfying bit is taking the jack out from underneath and doing up the bolts. However, we've encountered a bit of an issue. Do you remember a couple of videos ago when I put one new engine mount on the rear corner of the driver's side of this engine? Well, there's a problem with it. The front one is the original because you need to take the subframe out of the car to change the engine mount. Or at least that's the only way I can tell of changing it. But that back one, back before I had the clutch cover on the end, uh, me and Connor put this engine in the car and we sat it down on the two engine mounts on this side and we sat it down on the back engine mount on that side, the one that we could do because the mount on the engine side isn't on the clutch cover itself. We faffed about for hours trying to get it on. Of course, I've never put an engine in a car before, in any kind of car, but Connor's done it a million times just with metros, so that's why I invited him round and he helped, well, he did it while I watched. But we fought against that engine mount in the corner for ages, well over an hour to try and get it sitting on it. And that was only one of the two mounts on this side. Now that I've got the actual big bracket on the side of the engine, and I've got it sitting about level in the engine bay, there's no way it's going to line up. On the front corner, it looks as though with a little bit of wiggling it will sit down right, but on the back, it's just not going to happen. It, it physically cannot happen. And the reason I say that is because you've got the actual nut that goes on the bolt on the engine mount, and that's adjustable. There's like a big, you know, a fair amount of room um, for you to slide around and to get it sitting right. But on the other side of that same mount, there's a peg, and the peg has no adjustment in it whatsoever. So, but the peg is so far out on that corner, it's just nowhere near right. Um, it's got to be. Theoretically, with everything else lined up, it's a centimetre out. There's absolutely no way it's going to sit on that. There's no adjustment in it, so there's something wrong with that engine mount. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm not going to film this because this video is already going to be really long, and I've already done this before in one of the videos, is jack the engine up as high as I can, take that engine mount off the subframe, and swap to the original, because there is definitely something wrong with that engine mount. Back in episode 4, I mentioned that one of the mounts I bought wasn't genuine, so here's your warning. If they're available, buy genuine parts, and if they're not, hold on to your original parts. I've already been stung by non-genuine wheel bearings sourced from one of the premier mini part suppliers, failing after less than 1,000 miles. As your nan always used to say, buy cheap, buy twice. 
So now it's just a case of ticking off some of the boring bits that are just a case of reinstalling. Starting where we've just been with the clutch cable, which is braced to the transfer casing with a bracket. And after a little gnashing of teeth, I managed to get the new exhaust manifold lined up and bolted to the back of the cylinder head, complete with a new gasket. I'm moving rather off piece though, because rather than stick with the manifolds, I next decided to do some electrical work. I think the spaghetti was just getting in my way. However, I began on the other side of the engine bay, installing the horn and washer bottle to give me something to point the wires towards. Now we can do the important wiring, draping the loom over the engine bay and plugging in everything else, the stuff we need to actually make the car work, these two being the alternator and coolant temperature sensor. But back to the manifolds, and now it's time to fit the inlet, complete with its carburetor and the noisy air filter. I should just note that I couldn't fit the factory airbox even if I wanted to, as the vacuum takeoff for the brake servo is too tall on the MG inlet. If I wanted a factory looking filter, which I may fit sometime in the future, I'll have to find an MG one. With that in place, I can fit the crankcase breather in its hoses, as well as the vacuum advance for the distributor. The MG inlet has an additional takeoff, so I've blanked that off to make sure there aren't any leaks. Before doing the fuel feeds, we might as well do the fuel overflow, which runs out of the float chamber, down a stretch of hose, and to a solid pipe on the front of the clutch cover, which dumps it out onto the road. It was at this point that I made an executive decision, but before I did, I refitted the speedo cable, that's the one with the green clip on it, and screwed in the throttle and choke cables. I think we're done. There's nothing else I can think of that needs doing, other than hooking the battery up to it, which is on charge behind the camera, and putting some oil in the carburetor dash pot and putting some oil in the power unit. There are no parts left over, there's nothing I can think of, but still, I'm thinking, what have I not done? Um, so, we're ready to go. Obviously there's no radiator on it, there's no cooling system hooked up to it yet, uh, because what I'm gonna do is I'm going to crank over the engine with no fuel attached, so I've disconnected the pipe, um, from the tank to the pump. So I'll crank it over to make sure it makes oil pressure and it doesn't make any horrendous noises. Um, if it doesn't make oil pressure, it's not the end of the world because it might need that you know extra couple of revs just to make it make oil pressure. But I'd like to see the oil pressure, not only because it's all been apart, but because it's also got a new oil pump in there. So I'd like to see the oil pressure um, light go out, but we'll see what happens when it comes to it. As if it makes no horrendous noises, then I'll hook up the fuel and we'll go for an engine start. Um, if it starts and it doesn't make horrendous noises, then great, I'll turn it off and then I'll hook the cooling system up. Although I've put stuff in like the washer bottle, I put that in because it gives me something to point the wires at really. Um, but since I've done that, I thought, no, it would be a good idea to start it without putting the extra work in of doing the cooling system. So, fingers crossed it does work. <laughs> Um, but here we are, we're at this point now, so I'm a bit nervous. What else is there to do? Let's put some oil in. Although this technically isn't necessary just yet if we're not actually starting the car, I thought I'd do all the fluids in one go, so here is the dash pot oil. And without spilling any, the engine nectar. It's not pissing out of anywhere, so I must have done something right. Our final step is the battery, and amazingly, I'm not on fire. Should we give it a go? Well, at this point, I was far more concerned about the car rather than the camera, but it cranks cleanly. However, it didn't make enough oil pressure to turn the light out, but as I mentioned, I'm not concerned. Later that evening, I came out and fitted some new fuel hoses, so let's go for an engine start. Here we go. 
Notice the sniffing. My number one concern was for keeping the fuel where it's meant to be, and I quickly found the fuel pissing out of the bottom of the manifold. So I've taken the carburetor off the inlet manifold, and I've almost immediately found what my problem is. Between the two is this spreader plate, spacer plate thing, um, and it's metal, and it's the same one that I took off the original inlet manifold. And so I didn't think there was any issue with this, and I just put it back on. But of course, naturally, there should be, should be, a set of gaskets on this, and there aren't any. I, for some reason, had totally ignored this fact when I swapped over the inlet manifold, and the person who's been in here before decides to try and seal it with some kind of... feels like a silicon-based sealant, which obviously just gets eaten up by the fuel and then fails. But now that I've taken it off, it's definitely failed, so that's the reason fuel was absolutely gushing out the bottom of the inlet manifold. Um, so thank goodness I decided to stop where, where I was and just check for leaks before I went any further. So there we are. I now have, fortunately, some gaskets. So we'll put the gasket, we'll clean this up first of all, put some gaskets on and then try and go again. Well, it made oil pressure. <laughs> I don't think it's firing on all four cylinders. That's what I think's happening there. Oh, well, it, it kind of goes. It, I took my finger off the ignition key and it kept running for all of two seconds. Absolutely tremendous. A little bit of throttle is all it needed to get going. It didn't sound as though it was going on all four, but clearly it is. Um, that's all just smoke from my early fingerprints on everything. Because of course that exhaust is getting very hot. So. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So she runs. No cooling system, of course, so I didn't want to leave her running for too long, but the car works, and theoretically, she should move too. But that, along with all the other odds and sods, will have to wait for next time. So thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description, and I'll have more videos coming along soon.